What's up guys, this is Pete Clark and in today's video I'm going to try to rescue you guys from the fate that is consuming many aspiring poker players right now, which is unfortunately they are being blinded, deluded, and their game is being ruined by poker solvers. Solvers are not inherently evil, they're not trying to hurt you, but they work in such a way that it looks like they're giving you some kind of holy grail, secret recipe for success. But actually, when you truly understand what a solver is doing, you'll see that the raw imitation of a solver's output is actually very likely to wreck your chances at getting good at poker. Let's see why. Here's a common spot. We have Ace-King in the small blind, a recreational player that started with 84 big blinds, opens under the gun, and we 3-bet to 10. Fill in calls and we go to a flop of 898 eight with a false draw. Note that we have the King of Hearts and the Ace of Clubs here correlating with the cards on the board. We have a dilemma. What kind of strategy should we play? Do we bet or do we check with this hand? What size of bet am I going to use with my range here? What size of bet am I going to use with this hand? What frequency do I bet at? It's already a minefield. If we approach this spot by copying what a solver does, I believe we go very wrong and decimate our EV. Let's see why. If you give a solver two bet sizes here, one fifth pot and 60% pot, it always chooses 60% pot. At the end of this algorithm, which is actually a very long battle that it's had with itself, with full transparency as to its opponent's strategy at every single step in the process, it changes something. At the small blind, the under the gun player changes something. This goes on for millennia. It goes on for absolute ages. So many human lifetimes that you couldn't even imagine how long it would take humans to play this algorithm out in real life. Also, the solver has infinite processing power. What you're looking at is the end result of this battle that's occurred over basically infinity in a human time frame. So when it says you can only bet big here, what it's telling you is the result of this very long, arduous journey that it's just had against itself in a, in a few seconds. We've got a pretty powerful computer, not trying to brag. So when we look at the actual EV difference at the end of this algorithm, it's basically nothing. So while it's always choosing the bigger size here and it thinks that you lose microscopic amounts of EV by going smaller, and that's why it will pick the bigger size, there's actually nothing in it at all according to this algorithm, according to the result of this journey. For example, if you look at Queen of Spades, Queen of Clubs, the EV swing there is so small that it's completely negligible. This is a 5-10 game, so you're entitled to 292 chips or 29.2 big blinds with, with queens. Look at that, that tiny decimal swing. It's basically nothing. If you go to the hand that we have here, which is Ace of Clubs, King of Hearts, again, we see a similar thing where there's a small difference between the sizes but it's basically half a chip or 5% of a big blind. So this is, I don't know, I guess it's slightly convincing that like, okay, if I have nothing else to go on, if I have absolutely no idea how my opponent is playing, if I have no reads, I have no clue how he's going to react to either bet size at all, I'm just totally in the dark, then okay, solver, I'll, I'll choose the big bet. You've convinced me that maybe it's slightly better. That's what we should take from this output. But here's a really weird thing. I'm going to show you two different journeys now that the solver could have taken to analyze that spot with slightly different inputs. And I'm going to show you the absolute insanity of copying a solver output by showing you how different these are actually going to be for various hands in our range just by changing like one input and making the journey to this output different. But also before we move on, let's note here the exact EV and chips of our hand, Ace of Clubs, King of Hearts, it's 47.4. That's the best EV we can have with this hand in this sim. Take a note of that. The next sim I'm going to load up for you guys here. It's the sim where we're only allowed to bet one fifth pot. Only 20%. That's it. No big bets allowed. So surely now every hand is going to be worse, right? And indeed our range does lose EV. Our range has gone down from, don't know if you noticed, but it was 129 chips entitlement on average for our range in the last two sims. And now it's 125 because clearly there are a lot of hands in our range that suffer 
from not being able to bet big on this flop, from only having to, to bet smaller check. Okay, fair enough. So if I only am allowed to build one bet size and I have to just pick one, I'm not allowed to be fluid here at all. I'm not allowed to just do what I think is best with my hand. Because God forbid actually just doing what you think is the most profitable thing to do in this day and age, right? Then I have to actually bet big. Let's go to my hand in this sim. So just because my range is losing EV with this option doesn't mean that my hand is. My hand is now entitled to 54.15 chips. My hand has a higher expectation in this sim where I'm only allowed to bet 20% pot than it did when I was allowed to use both sizes. The absurdity of the solver. The solver would get re-exploited. In the solver's world, where there's transparency, utter transparency as to the strategy that it's playing, it would get re-exploited by its imaginary solver opponent. Because if it bet big with aces, which is a hand that you have to bet big with or you lose EV, and it bet small with ace-king, what would happen is that the other solver would go, oh, when you bet small, you've got ace-king, but when you bet big, you've got aces, so I'm going to kill you. I'm going to actually murder you like this. And it would lose all the EV and it would get exploited. You wouldn't be in a Nash equilibrium anymore, would you? Because you'd be getting exploited. But in real life, people don't know what we're doing, guys. Chill out. It's okay. Like, no one knows that you're betting one hand one size and another hand another size. I'm against a recreational player here. He doesn't... He's not started with a full stack. He might not even have one buy-in in his PokerStars account. Maybe he does. Maybe he has thousands. Who knows? But the point is that, according to the solver... It looks like it would be better if I was allowed to, to just small bet ace king and big bet aces and just be done with it. And if I'm not worried about being exploited for that, which of course I'm not, because that would be to be worried that a random recreational player is going to exploit you for small betting ace king when you would have big bet aces is like having some kind of bizarre paranoid delusion that the government has got cameras in your office and is watching everything you do and sending it to China. I don't know, some weird fantasy like that. So I'm not going to be subject to that sort of the level of delusion. And therefore, I don't really care that the solver, when given both sizes, was using only B60. I don't care that it thinks that my overall range loses four chips. I'm not trying to play my range. I'm not trying to make my range some unexploitable haven on the assumption that this player has perfect information about my strategy and is going to kill me as soon as I do anything differently. So yeah, copying solvers is really absurd. Here's my real life argument for why I think I should small bet this flop or check. I think big betting this spot, even though the solver said big bet when given the choice to recommend a strategy, it's wrong. Because if I big bet against the recreational player here, What's going to happen is, he'll be shoving, probably more than the sim, jamming jacks, jamming queens. You know, you've got this flop, you've got an overpair, you flatted a 3-bet. What are you going to do? He'll be jamming some draws, jack 10, hearts, etc. I'll be folding this hand, I'll be realising no equity. He will not be calling enough worse hands, I don't think he's going to call enough like random ace queen or king queen of clubs or something. Just in general, this is my feeling on how the recreational side of the pool plays, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to those views, guys. You sometimes hear people say stuff like, you can't possibly just assume how they're playing. I'm sorry, but if, if my, like, billion years as a poker dinosaur gathering information on how my opponents play has led to nothing, and I am still clueless about how a recreational player plays this spot on average, then I have failed, my friends. I have really failed in my journey to get good at this game. I basically just have to copy a solver now every time. How sad. So, effectively... I am very confident that a big bet with this hand against this player loses EV. I'm very confident that it's a big mistake and that if I do it, I'm going to just suck at cards and lose tons of money. And the solver actually agrees with me in a weird way because when it was allowed to bet small because it had no fears about counter exploitability, you, you restrict its options and then this hand becomes better in its mind because now it's okay to bet small because it had to bet small with everything else as well. But as soon as it wants to bet big, because it slightly prioritizes the aces over the ace-king, fair enough, now you're no longer allowed to bet small with this hand, even though in the real world, betting small is better than betting big. So if I bet big with this hand against this player, it's really bad. 
Some of you guys may know that this April is the last time the Carrot Poker School is running live as a university style intense academic course. It's not too late for you to sign up to the full scholarship program which gives you access to grades 1, 2 and 3. Grade 2 live classes are kicking off from this Monday through to Friday. That's from the 18th to the 22nd of April and then we'll have grade 3 in the last week of the month from the 25th through to the 29th. Even though grade one has already happened, it's not too late to sign up for that as well and simply jump into the Discord group to watch the videos back for all of the classes you might have missed. After this, the Carrot Poker School is going to switch over to being a video course permanently, so do take advantage of the last chance ever you have to work with me and the rest of the students in real time over a Zoom call and do some interactive lectures. Signing up for the Carrot Poker School is really easy, just head on over to carrotcorner.com forward slash carrot poker school. From there, you can select the school that you would like to take, or alternatively, why not grab our full scholarship program and save £500 while you're at it. There are tons of different payment options available so that when you go to checkout, you can pay via PayPal, Stripe, or credit card. Upon paying, you'll be sent a prompt email from myself with links to join the Discord groups for the respective classes that you've signed up for, and everything happens on Discord from there. All classes happen between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. UK time, Monday to Friday. If you can't make that time zone, don't worry, they all are recorded, as I say, and I'll look forward to welcoming loads more of you into our Discord groups for these classes this weekend. Another area where people go really wrong when they're trying to use a solver to check their line is that they simply glance at the strategy the solver takes without going to the node directly after their decision point, i.e. their opponent's reaction, and comparing how the opponent's solver is reacting to that line compared with how they expect humans to react. People are extremely imperfect. They have different ranges from the ones you plug into your sims right from the get-go. They filter them differently on the flop, the turn. They reach that, that spot later in the hand with a totally different range to the one that you're looking at in the solver, and then they react differently again with that range when you take your action. Here's an example. Ace-King in the big blind. We go for 3-bet here. Villain calls. The flop is jack 4-3 with two clubs. If you've been following closely, you will know that the only option on this flop is to play a big bet strategy, because it's another one of these high nut advantage situations where the solver prioritizes the EV of aces, kings, and queens, and then plays a big bet. With ace-king, this might actually just be... I think this one is okay, actually, because of the, the number of pocket pairs and things folding here. Like, I think on this texture, it, it functions a lot more like a bluff. So I think this is an okay bet. I'm not going to, like, hate on this one like I did before. But the point of this hand is the turn play. Villain calls a big bet. This is normal. He won't be playing many raises here, in theory, at least. And I don't think in practice many regs are raising here. This is a reg, by the way. So then that's right. Just because I'm playing a reg doesn't mean I should just copy a solver there either. Solvers and regs are extremely different. Regs play extremely differently to equilibrium, even when they think that they're getting close to it. They're not. It's hard. They're much further away than they would like to think. So on the turn here, we can bet or check. We check. Villain bets third pot. Going to be a good sizing for his range because it's... This, this wouldn't be a, a sensible spot for him to start betting massive. He has a lot of thinner value bets here, and we do still have uncapped regions like overpairs and stuff. So this play is fine. And now I really want to show you what the solver thinks of my play, which is jamming. Will it like it? Will it hate it? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Pause the video, have a think. How do you think the solver will react to my jam here? How do you think pool will react? Is this better against humans than it is against solvers? These are the kind of questions we should be asking. I'm going to do an impersonation now of the guy that you don't want to be. You don't want to be this guy. Okay, so we're going to line check our, our action here. So we went for the big bet on the flop. Yes, that seems fine. Villain called. The three of hearts came. And it looks like our hand... Ace King, it's, it's can, it can bet or it can check. Now, this is fascinating. Look at all these different suits. Look at all the different things they're doing. This is amazing, guys. I mean, when you unblock the blocker to the unblocked blocked blocker, you can actually at 23% frequency bet. But when you unblock the blocker's blocker to the unblocked blocker's blocker, 
it has to be 84%. Okay, so we decide to check this time and he bets small. Yes, very good. Seems like he played perfectly here. And yes, our hand can raise because we don't have the club great. So we played the hand well. We played it fine. We should be mixing 27% call though as well. But that's really well done by us. Okay, let's close the solver. So that person is just me channeling like a guy that is really, really nerdy about copying solvers. I'm just trying to do my nerdiest voice. Um, Probably just my normal voice. He is failing to understand that the goal of poker isn't to just get close to this arbitrary random output that you're looking at. Okay, it's not totally arbitrary, but like I said, the algorithm that's been run to reach this output is not using the same inputs and ranges that the real life battle is, is going to be using. So it's a good baseline, but you have to take the baseline, know what you can trust from it, and then look at what might be different in the next spot. So for example here, the solver thinks, yeah, no problem, like the same EV shoving this hand as calling it, unblocking the clubs is a key component of this. If you switch on the EV view, which is what our friend there should have done, he would have seen that actually it's a very big um, swing when you, okay, not a big swing, but when you jam, let's say, with the king of clubs in your hand, it's like a two big blind difference to when you don't have it. That's kind of relevant, 20 chips is two big blind, so ace of spades, king of clubs, for example. So there's some meaningful stuff going on there. Not having a club appears to be the the standard for, for jamming ace king is a semi bluff denial bet that slash getting value from some flush draws jam. It's a multifunctional jam. So you want to understand the reason why it's good, first of all. Then you want to look at how you expect the solver to react. So the solver's reaction to this shove is to fold tens sometimes, but usually just call off tens, to always call off nines, to call off eights most of the time, to not bet eights or sevens very often anyway. And then the only thing it's actually folding here is stuff like ace, queen, king, queen, like these really bad combos. And that's because the pot odds are phenomenal. Do you guys think that humans call off tens and nines at that frequency? Do you think that they never fold the jack? There'll be some human out there that like levels himself and folds the jack here. It will exist, right? Especially at lower stakes. It will exist. Maybe not a competent player at 200 zoom, but it will exist. I think that the fold equity we get here is way more than this, and the reason for that is I think hands like eight sevens get bet more often than this, for sure. I also think that people are betting hands like king ten of spades more often than this on the turn when they've called flop. I just think their range is weaker, and I think it's less likely to bluff catch the, the bluff jam, um, the shove. So, for that reason, I think this play is fantastic. I think it's actually really, really good against humans, and it's like clearly the best line. So going back to the original strategy now, we go back to the node on which our decision was was present. I don't think it's actually acceptable to not shove this hand. Given how much better than in equilibrium I think this jam is in real life, I think we should absolutely shove this hand every single time. And if we don't, we're making a blunder in real life. That's my firm belief. So the way I'm using the solver, as you guys can see, is that it's very much about What's the baseline and what's different? What does it say under its set of parameters and what's different in the real set of parameters in the real world? And how am I to make sense of the EV, the likely EV of a, of a certain line or strategy or play or whatever based on what I think is different to the solver's realm? That's how we should be thinking about it. We don't want to be this guy that's just going through and line checking. It's really, really stupid, it's dumb. It's a waste of your time. It's not even playing the game anymore. You're just becoming some mindless robot. Yes, you can learn about how poker theory works by using a solver and picking up on patterns and seeing why things are the case. But there is honestly no worse thing you can do than be a solver monkey. A parrot that simply copies strategies. One final thing I want to say is that throughout the course of this video, what you've seen me do with the solver is operate in terms of EV. I've had this button clicked in PIO2, strategy plus EV. Very important thing to have on. If I'm just looking at strategy, I get really deluded. For example, if I go back to the flop and I look at queens, I might, for example, say, ah, 
this hand is much much better to to bet look at the bet frequency it's so high queens is, is clearly preferring to bet I have people who love to use this word about solvers prefer doesn't prefer anything um it's a robot queens doesn't prefer to bet it just usually bets in this equilibrium that's the least exploitable way to play that also maximizes the ev of the strategy against the solver strategy but the thing is if you turn on the ev view you'll see that there's no difference between betting and checking not really like shred of a chip if you care about like three cents or something in a 10 20 game then okay whatever but you need to understand that strategy isn't showing you what's better it's just showing you what the unexploitable max ev strategy happens to look like here so let's summarize going back to our original question do solvers do more harm or do more good in your game when you're studying poker well i think for someone like me they do more good because i've been very careful that i know how to use a solver and i've really thought about it for many many years and i've developed a very sort of methodical approach on on how to get the most out of that and i think it still does harm to me as well i wouldn't say that it only does good in my own game there's definitely times when i copy solvers accidentally without meaning to it's a really easy trap to fall into we learn by imitation we do this in our culture as humans in our society in our tribes back in the day so it's very tempting to copy the sort of gospel looking feedback of a solver but it's not gospel and you shouldn't copy it um but i think for weaker players i think for for people playing micro stakes just coming up in the game just getting a foothold to grab a solver i think it's awful i think it decimates their chances of becoming a good poker player i think it teaches them that they need to just be slaves to charts this happens pre-flop when people don't deviate from charts it happens post-flop when people try and copy solvers only post-flop they can't even copy it you might think you're copying a solver you're not you're just playing some random strategy that's a little bit maybe slightly more like a solver than before but it's still way off from what the solver is doing and playing like the solver it's not the way to maximize your ev in reality it really isn't it's been proven that solvers don't have large win rates after rake um, in games like 500 zoom or one i have a small 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 win rate so your ambition should never be to just adhere to what the solver is saying you should do you might run good for a while doing it you might get some positive reinforcement you won't be playing a terrible strategy if you get good at it but guys it's all about thinking it's about thinking better than your opponents can think and it's about playing well against the way that they're really playing it's about exploiting their real ranges that's where ev truly comes from i hope this video has been useful I hope that it's shone some light on a pretty grey area of the game um, and I hope it will save you a lot of time and a lot of money in future just by moving away from imitation and towards free thought and being a human and not being a robot. Alright guys, you know where to go, carrotcorner.com for everything from me and if you're watching this in the future, hopefully everyone's realised how to think about poker and all my students no longer copy solvers but also the Carrot Poker School will be out from June um, as a video course on CarrotCorner.com. So if you're watching this in June, July 2022, if you're watching this in 2024, go grab it at CarrotCorner.com. This has been Pete. See you guys soon for another video. Peace out. Bye for now.